Our scripture reading is from the Gospel according to John chapter 17. We'll be reading verses 6 through 21. We saw last prayer service, this very um, prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we've been looking at the intercession of Christ, this will be the last part uh, as we focus upon Christ as our intercessor. Um, John 17, beginning in verse 6. In verse 1, the Lord Jesus began addressing the Father in prayer. And in verse 6, he continues... I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to see to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept them. I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Thus far, in the reading of God's holy word. Amen. And as I said, we have this evening the last portion of, um, of the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ. In our series on prayer, we considered the intercession of the Spirit and how He helps to create prayer in our hearts. And we've been looking at the intercession of Christ. We saw the, the need of intercession, the reality that because Christ here on earth was our atonement, intercession has to happen. It is what Christ is doing this very instant in our behalf. Um, he never ceases interceding for us. We looked at the nature of intercession. Um, first, looking at what intercession consists of. And remember those three things. This is very helpful to understand the, the simple reality of intercession. That Christ is presenting himself in behalf of his own. And in doing so, he's presenting the blood of the atonement for those for whom he has died. He is also presenting our prayers to God the Father. Our prayers cannot reach the ears of the Heavenly Father if it does not go through the intercessory work of Christ. But then we've also been seeing, and today we even spend a long time, and we have been, on the fact that he presents his own prayers. He presents himself, your prayers, and his prayers. And it's talking about his prayers that we've been looking at the character of Christ um, as our intercessor. And, and so that was 
what intercession consists of, those three things. And we began talking last time about the power of the intercession of Christ. And, and power, of course, in these three ways. Power in interceding in our behalf, appearing before the Father in our behalf. That, that's why you and I can have forgiveness of sins, because of the power of Christ. When He intercedes that God would forgive us, um, He has all power for that to happen. And, and also as He prays for us and also as He uh, offers our prayers to the Father, it, it is all done through power. And, and, and I want to talk a little more detail about this power. So our first point tonight is um, the prayers of Christ are powerful. So it's looking at the power of Christ's intercession. And our second point is that the prayers of Christ are precious. So we will focus on the power of and the preciousness of the intercessory work of Christ and of the very prayers of Christ. And so looking at the power of Christ's intercession, the first thing to note is, is a very simple reality that there is power in the intercession of Christ simply because of the omnipotence of Christ. Christ is all-powerful, so everything that He does carries his very omnipotence. Um, he's divine and he is higher than any other priest that this world has ever had. He is the supreme high priest. And he pleads upon his efficacious sacrifice for our good. And when you, when you think of these three realities, his divinity, his um, supreme high priest position, and that he pleads based upon his sacrifice here on earth, his atoning work, um, these three realities assure us that his intercession will prevail with the Father. There, there is no greater um, way by which one could prevail with the Father. There's no higher person to intercede for you and me. There's no higher work that he could be based upon than his atoning work. And there's no higher office than the Lord Jesus as a high priest. And so it's, it's amazing to think of the reality of, of, of his power in, in those terms. Um, this world has seen powerful men. Um, even the Bible says that the, the, that the efficacious prayer of the righteous availeth much. And, and it's the power of righteousness that is at play there. So that when Elijah prayed for there not to be rain and then prayed for there to be rain, there was power that went forth in that prayer. And it was based upon his righteousness. Based, of course, when it is based on the righteousness, it's still based then on the grace of God to have given that righteousness to Elijah. But see, there have been other men of great power. Um, Moses, you think of when he put that staff upon the waters and they parted. God was using him as an intercessor whereby when Moses pled in behalf of the people, God answered. And there was great manifestation of power in that pleading. And when, when Moses pled for the people, when they were all bitten by snakes and, and they were all dying and he was an intercessor praying, it was a powerful intercessor, intercession because God answered and then provided that means of the brazen serpent. But there's no one greater and more powerful than Jesus. And, and Moses can't plead for you and me anymore because he's no longer here. Um, and Moses couldn't even go directly before the Father. He was an intercessor here. But remember, he could never see, he did see the Father in a sense. You read of it being where he saw him face to face. But we know that that was not in the plenitude of the presence of God. He wasn't seeing God in the fullness of his majesty. Remember when he asked to see God's glory, it had to be while it was full of, 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 of the smoke. And then God had to clothe, cover his face and God only appeared with his back. Those were means of protecting Moses because he's not an intercessor like Jesus. And so... Just a simple omnipotence of Christ. And then secondly, we think of the relationship of Christ. Um, Moses was a prophet before the people of God. But Jesus 
is the Son of God. And we start with that, just thinking of that relationship of a son to a father. And I'm bringing a lot of the Puritans here to, to help us. And, and William Bridge, he says this, Great be the rhetoric of a child, if a child do but cry, Father. Especially if the child be a wise child, he may prevail much with a tender-hearted father. And I think all of us as parents, um, if it is anyone else asking for something, and think of your child asking for something, and how truly the, the cords of your heart of sympathy are, are stronger for your children. And if we were to give something to a stranger that we deny our child, that would betray our love to them. Jesus is a son, and he comes to the Father in that relationship. Um, and, and how often we hear God speaking of the Son. This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. And if He tells you and me to listen to Jesus, how much more the Father then does listen to Jesus, to what He would pray and what He would ask. And He's not only a Son in His relationship, He's an obedient Son. And that also is very powerful. And again, fathers and mothers, it is one thing to give a a request of a child, but then isn't it true when that child, just like Bridge speaks of a wise child, or think of an obedient child, a child who, who be, before you ask for things, they are doing things. And, and when they ask for something, of course, that, that element of obedience has, has a way of melting your heart to give what they ask. Um, Charnock says this, Stephen Charnock, another Puritan, Though the relation of a son be endearing, yet when the quality of obedience is added to the dearness of that relation, it enlarges and inflames paternal affection. And of course, maternal as well. And renders the father more inclinable to grant any request that is made. As a king will listen more to the petitions of a son who had done him signal service and brought by his achievements a renown and honor to his name and government. So he's a son. That's the relationship. He's an obedient son. And then thirdly, he is a king. And, and I put this under the relationship of Christ because you could say he is the father's king. Um, Remember, in, in his ruling, he is ruling for the Father. They are co-rulers. The Father has set Christ upon his throne to rule. And, and, and you could speak of that rule as a servant rule to the Father, as they co-rule together. And so, if he was given to rule upon this world, if all power was given to Jesus upon, in heaven and on earth... Well, then, for Christ to exert this power, his intercession before the Father has to be honored, has to be heard. And so, there's power because of the omnipotence of Christ. There's power because of the relationship of Christ. But then there's also power because of the covenant with Christ, the Father's covenant with Christ. Um, remember how the reality of Christ being here on earth and now as an intercessor in heaven is all connected to the covenant between the Father and the Son. When, when the Father told the Son, um, Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. When God said that, he made a promise to the Son and he put himself, as it were, in contract with the Son. So that when the Son does ask for a person, asks for a people, the Father has to give because he told the Son he would. And so there's a relationship of a covenant. The Father bound himself to listen to the Son and to do what he says. Because the Son does what the Father told him to do. And so it is, it is not only a covenant agreement that they're in, but it's, it's a perfect agreement. And this is really the fourth thing. So power, because of the omnipotence of Christ, the relationship of Christ, the covenant with Christ, and also the agreement between Christ and the Father. 
Um, they're all so connected. It's this covenant reality. It, it, the father doesn't say, well, now that I told you I would, I guess I will. It's never with that kind of tension. It is always with a perfect and harmonious agreement. I, I remember still today, I don't know if you remember when we were um, in one of our family conferences, Pastor McLeod, he was talking about the unity. It was that whole conference on, on oneness of the church, but then also at the, looking at the oneness of the Trinity. And I remember he said the remark that between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is never, ever a disagreement. That they always are harmonious with one another. They have existed forever and they have never disagreed. And just putting it in that terms where, you know, we as humans, we know what disagreement is and we see it everywhere. And it can be lesser or greater extent. But really it exists because we're not perfect. We're not, we, don't, we don't know exactly how everything ought to go. And sometimes there are motives in our hearts that are not pure. Or there's information in our minds that's not exact. It's not just because of some evil in us that we don't disagree. It's weakness. We're humans. But not the Trinity. And so there's perfect agreement. And William Bridge says this, The Father has as great an inclination and disposition unto the work that Christ intercedes for, as Christ himself hath. And so never there is a moment where Christ is pleading for something that he needs to convince the Father to do. That never, ever happens. And, and this is important for us to re realize because it's true that the wrath of the Father is upon us if our sins are in us. And Christ must appease that wrath by dying on the cross. But see, when he does that, he's not convincing the Father not to pour his wrath on us. Because he's there on the cross because the Father told him to be there. And so, so, see, he's not convincing the Father. He's simply doing what the Father commanded him to do. And he puts it this way again. Bridge says, the Father loves Christ again for loving us. See, he loves us and sends the Son. The Son pleads for us and the Father gives what the Son wants. But why? Not just because he loves the Son. He loves us too. There's always agreement. And so the intercession of Christ is powerful because of the, power, the omnipotence of Christ, the relationship of Christ. He is a son, an obedient son. He's a king. He is his king because of the covenant with Christ and because of the agreement between the Father and the Son. And then lastly, that we could talk about there's power in the intercession of Christ because of the eternity of Christ. Um, the Puritans even put this as a second point. They would say, what characterizes the intercession of Christ? It is powerful. And many of the things we just talked about, they would go at length describing. And then they would say as another point, it is eternal. In a sense, it stands on its own. But I'm putting it here as one more proof of its power. And, and you could understand why. Why is Christ's intercession powerful? Because it never, ever, ever ends. It is eternal. Remember, that's, that's even one of the emphases, emphases in Hebrews where it spoke of the priests of old. They all needed to be replaced. And there was always a need for another intercessor because the last one died. And, 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 and they were without one. And if it weren't for the priest's next son or another line of the Aaron um, priesthood, the people would be without an intercessor. And so Aaron, remember, was replaced by Nadab and Abihu, who didn't last too long. And they were replaced by Eleazar and Ithamar, and so on and so forth. But the Lord Jesus, he never dies. He never is on a chair like Eli and hears a bad news and falls and breaks his neck. The Lord Jesus died on the cross, but resurrected from the grave. And he's on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, never ceasing to make intercession for us and that makes him a powerful intercessor and so that's our first point now secondly we're going to see how the prayers of Christ are precious and it's putting together everything we've been seeing the last three um, prayer services some applications um, all of this 
put together means that Christ as our intercessor is a very precious truth. Um, and it is so precious that we must f- be greatly thankful for it. Indeed, we will be eternally thankful for it. See, there won't be one moment even in heaven that we won't be mindful that we are there only because Christ is our intercessor. You see, His atoning work will have an efficacious power for all eternity. See, if there was one moment that He stopped interceding for us, even after we're in heaven, we would then have to leave heaven. His intercession isn't just sufficient to shuttle us into heaven and then from there on we will be in our celestial works and merits. You see, forever we are there in heaven thanks to the intercessory work of Christ. It is, it is hard for us to even conceive of this. And, it, and it, the precious thing about the intercession of Christ is we hit upon a doctrine that in a certain way it puts all of us at the very foot of the cross, there on Calvary's hill, perhaps looking at the multitude, and, and now thankfully with what God has given us, we are not one of the people who are raising our fist and, and saying, well, get out of the cross if you are the Christ and we will believe in thee. No, we're not there. We're just looking at Christ and saying, this, what thou hast done for me, on this Calvary day is what makes me be here in heaven forever and ever and ever. And it brings the day in Calvary's cross present for today. It is not an old thing of the past. It is now present. It is so present that when John looks at heaven and considers the Lamb of God, he is as one who is slain. There's something about the bloodiness and the slain reality of what Christ suffered on earth there in heaven. And if it's in heaven in the day that John penned Revelation, it is a reality in heaven now. And it will be a reality in heaven when you and I are there. Blessed be God for those who are saved. You see, the intercession of Christ brings the cross to be as, as, as punctual as this hour. That You need it now. It is that precious. Are you thankful that Jesus is your intercessor? Are you thankful that Jesus prays for you little children? And you hear your parents pray for you and, and they'll, they'll say your name and, and say, Lord, please be with this dear child. And it's precious to you, I'm sure, that your father, your mother are praying for you. Always remember, Jesus prays for his own. And this is what I love about this precious prayer of Jesus. He says, um, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Verse 20 of John 17. If you believe in Jesus, your name is in this verse. Because you are those who believe in him. And Jesus prayed for you that day. See how it starts making the cross come very much to the present? The intercession of Christ, it's so precious that we'll be eternally grateful for it. And we need to start, if we haven't been yet, so mindful. And then one more thing, the intercession of Christ is so precious that we must make great use of it. And this is one of the most obvious uses of all this truth. Um, Every time I preach on this, I'm so convicted because what it tells me is I should pray more. Because this is where you really grasp this doctrine. You go to your prayer and you're mindful. I am here praying because of all of these truths. I have the Spirit within me. He's creating prayer. Jesus is in heaven receiving my prayer. He is blessing and making this prayer that has so many imperfections. He's making it heaven worthy. And most and best of all, He is praying for me in heaven. And if I appreciate that he's praying there, I should be praying more here. Do you use this doctrine? Do you make use of it? Do you pray more? Do you, in your prayers, even when those feelings come and your thoughts go everywhere, this doctrine should help you. Because you should say, Lord, now my mind is so distracted. I'm so thankful that everything sinful in my prayer is being purged by the blood of Christ. I'm so thankful that even these distractions, pretty soon they'll be gone. Because I know 
the Spirit is helping me. And, and you must be your own witness, aren't you? The coldness and the difficulty and the hardness in our hearts and prayers are always invariably, of course, maybe not 100% for every one of us, but the first 10, 5 to 10 minutes of prayer may be that way. But if you are disciplined to be there 15, 20, 30 minutes, you know what I mean. The tears might even come forth. The heart may start being heavy with, with grace and joy that gives a lightness to the heart. And you remember people that you had forgotten to pray for. And it comes easier to you than ever. You, you just think, I, I need to have a longer time in prayer. And why is it flowing that way? Because Jesus is praying for you. Because the Spirit is creating prayer in your heart. But we can't just sit down and say, okay, all of that is good, so I'll just live my life. No, you need to use it. You need to use this truth by praying. It is so precious. You must be grateful forever for it. It must be so precious that you must use this doctrine. It must be so precious that you cannot afford despising it. Now, here what I mean is those who despise Christ as their own intercessor. There's a way by which a Christian can despise it because he's not praying much and he's not being mindful of all these truths. But I'm here speaking of someone who says, I don't need a mediator. And beloved, think of what's happening here. And maybe I could put this in a sermon another time with more, with more time. Jesus pleads for his own. If you despise his pleading, well, then you have to be ready to have him as your judge. If you don't want him pleading for you, you will have him pleading against you. This is what I mean. This doctrine is too precious. You cannot afford despising it. Because if, if you despise him as your advocate, you will have him as your prosecuting attorney. This is a call to repentance and faith. It is a call to be sure that you're one of these for whom Jesus prays and not others for whom he doesn't pray. Because he says that he doesn't pray for everyone. I pray not for the world. So there's some for whom Jesus doesn't pray, doesn't intercede for. Well, what do, you do, what do we do with this? Well, we, we come to the Lord and plead that we not be one of those. Because who are those who ask that very thing? Are those for whom he pled? Because he's giving those words in your heart that he would be your intercessor. Those who despise it don't care and wouldn't pray that way. What is so precious for all the, and you should, and this is what it means that it's precious. We should be grateful for it. We should make use of it. We cannot afford despising it. And I don't want to run. There's a few more things I want to say. Um, and and I'll, I'll just end with this. It is so precious that not a single other mediator can ever be found. To compete with Christ. It is astonishing to think that knowing these truths, people would actually try it, but they do. The whole religious system from the medieval times stopped looking to Jesus as their sole mediator and started looking to their own works and merits and to the saints and to the popes. And even priests were seen as intercessors. Oh, you don't want to compete with Jesus. Because none is like Jesus. None has atoned for sin to intercede for sinners. None is in the category of a son as Jesus is to intercede before the Father. None is the king of the universe to intercede for all people all over the world who would pray to him. None has purchased a people that this very people could come to him for help and for blessings. None has suffered for his own. None is more loving. None is more sympathetic, more patient, more caring, more gracious, more merciful than the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Why would anyone choose a human intercessor as sanctified and beatified as a system may make him or her to be? There's none that surpasses Jesus. And I pray that this, along with all we've been studying about prayer, can fuel and strengthen our prayers. Let us pray. Our gracious, heavenly intercessor in heaven, we beseech thee, Lord, that thou would hear our prayers now at this hour and bless them and sanctify them, make them worthy of the very Father's hearing. And Lord, what an astonishing truth to think we can come directly to thee, O Father, because of the atoning work of Christ, because he's even now at thy right hand making intercession for us. Forgive us, Lord, all our infirmities, all of our sins. Cleanse us and pardon us and help us to make use of this blessed truth, not only for prayer, but even for assurance of forgiveness and assurance that we're received, that we may be in thy presence in heaven for the assurance of faith, for the strengthening of our faith, for even encouraging us to make the name of Christ known, knowing that He holds our name before Thee in heaven, would we not hold His name before the world here on earth? Even evangelism, Lord, is connected to this um, doctrine. So help us, Lord, to use it, all for Thine honor and glory, in whose name we pray, the Lord Jesus' name, amen.